So this morning we're going to start with the Community Services Committee. And in that committee we have Councillor Thiessen, myself, Councillor Bosch, Councillor Berg, and Mayor Clayton. We have um, one delegation we're happy to, to meet this morning. And uh, we'll start with calling this to order. Okay. Do I have to give the time or you're good? You're good. Okay. <laughs> Our first delegation is from Mr. Wearmouth, and he is going to advise us uh, from the Peace Country Historical Society about requesting the Community Service Committee to designate the old Grand Prairie Courthouse, currently the Center of Creative Arts, um, as a municipal historic resource. Um, so welcome, Mr. Wearmouth. Can you hear us? I have Pat Wearmouth, and yet I have David online. Is this a different person? Uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Chair Bosch, um, I do believe that the Historical Society was not able to join us this morning, um, but Dr. David Leonard, who is co-presenting um, uh, as a delegation, is online. Um, so I'm, uh, Mr. Leonard, would you be happy to proceed or? Well, sure I would, yeah. It's, I, I'm also a member of the Peace Country Historical Society, and that's one hat I'd be wearing. The other is from the perspective of Alberta culture. I retired from Alberta culture uh, uh, in 2012, but prior to then, I'd spent 13 years on their historical designation committee. And so I know a number of the ins and outs of getting buildings designated and what the obligations are and what the benefits are to that. So I can speak to that also. Look, we look forward to hearing about that. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, to start right back from the beginning, it's going to be information for some people. Um, but I think it's best to put it in proper historical context. Way back in the 1970s, the Alberta government embarked on a program to <clears throat> acquire and designate certain buildings in the province as historic sites, or they call them historic resources. And uh, the Minister of Culture at the time, Horst Schmidt, uh, thought that the provincial government would actually own, or if not own, directly manage all of the historical resources in the province. Well, there were so, and they did acquire a number of them uh, throughout the province, the northern one that we're familiar with being Dunbegin, but that's a very expensive um, uh, proposal to actually acquire and own and manage all these sites. So in the early 1980s, the Historical Resources Act was amended to facilitate the designation of certain buildings, which if the provincial government wouldn't actually own, but would sort of monitor and provide historical resources grants, matching grants for individuals or businesses or corporations or municipalities to actually manage certain uh, sites. And um, buildings like the Sexsmith Blacksmith Shop for example, and in Grand Prairie, the Forbes Homestead and the uh, old Grand Prairie High School were designated to be provincial historic resources. And they were divided into two classes, <clears throat> the provincial resources, which were those considered to be significant to the province as a whole, or those registered sites that were more significant to the history of the community or the district in which they were part. Well, this got on and the grants uh, for restoration work were provided by the Alberta Historical Resources Foundation. And yet, throughout the years, there's so many sites being designated that uh, there wasn't just enough money in the pot, as it were, to provide meaningful assistance to the, all these municipalities and the sites that uh, were in them. So the provision was made 
the, around the turn of the 20th century, I don't know exactly when, for municipalities to themselves designate buildings as historical sorry, historic resources. And if they do, there would be uh, a, a register, and it's called the Provincial Register of Historic Places, which if the buildings are put onto that register, they will be eligible for matching grants from Alberta Culture for restoration work. Now, this is not renovation work because once a building is designated, there is that obligation that whoever owns it will not either demolish it or substantially alter it from its original ethos, as it were. So with that, there was a, a committee formed in Grand Prairie, and I forget who all was on it, the name Wally Stokes, uh, comes to mind, and Margaret Heath was a counselor. And um, with the city was one Lois Harper, who was very enthusiastic about this, to have buildings designated as municipal historic resources, because the provincial government just is big enough and, uh, and isn't wealthy enough to provide meaningful grants to all of the sites. So with this uh, provision, the city contracted... Um, Robert Buckle Associates to work with their committee and develop a report, which I hope you have access to, and it's this one here, um, Grand Prairie Municipal Heritage Inventory. And they evaluated uh, a number of sites within the city and uh, not recommending necessarily that they be designated by the city as municipal historic resources, but they would be worthy of consideration. Now, the report was tabled and accepted by the city in 2006, and um, the um, uh, intent was that these would be further evaluated and recommendations would be made that some of these sites would be designated as municipal historic resources. If so designated, the application could be made to Alberta Culture to have these placed on the Provincial Register of Historic Places, meaning the owners of these sites would be um, eligible for matching grants for restoration work. Now, to be put on that Provincial Register, of course, the owners are going to have to be agreeable in all of this. In all of this whole process, there have been only two cases in which the, uh, the municipality and the province have designated sites as historic resources against the wishes of the owner. Now, you can't force anybody to restore a building, but in the case of the, um, uh, the Edmonton Power Plant of the River Valley in Edmonton and the Lougheed uh, Commercial Building in downtown Calgary, the owners didn't want them. But uh, the municipalities and the provincial government went along with designating them anyway. But that is very, very rare that any property will be designated against the wishes of the owner. So in all of this, in all the sites that uh, were in here, the city of Grand Prairie actually owns one of them, and that is the old courthouse built in 1957. The, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, city and those responsible didn't really move on anything after that report was done in 2006. And finally, in uh, 2018, the city received a letter from me on behalf of the Peace Country Historical Society wanting to know what's going to be happening with all of these resources that were identified. Are you going to actually designate any of them so that they can get matching grants for restoration work? Well, uh, we received a letter in January 2019 from Charles Taws saying that he has been assigned the role of monitoring all of this whole process. And Charles and the late Mary Netting made a review of all of the sites. And then I myself, because I have experience with Alberta culture and I'm interested in the history of the, uh, the area, I um, uh, was asked to make a further review of them just a couple of years ago, and I did, and I met with Charles, and we reviewed all the sites. A lot of them were gone, like the old Gaiety Theater just isn't there anymore. The York Hotel was considered, maybe not seriously, but considered a possible historic resource. And we looked at the uh, 
various sites that were identified and we came up with an A list, things that we should probably concentrate on to have them uh, designated. Now, as I said, you will not designate anything and should not try against the wishes of the owners. But there are carrots in all of this, the carrots being that the value of the property will accrue and increase if it is recognized as a municipal historic resource. And um, also the uh, money, there will be money. If the building is placed on the Provincial Register of Historic Places, it's eligible for matching grants for restoration work. And that sometimes is um, not understood fully. A big difference between restoration and renovation. Historic resources, once designated, should not be substantially altered and certainly not demolished in any way. So Charles and I, we developed an A list, and that included the William Innes House, 1914 log cabin uh, on the um, Bear Creek to the, um, to the south of the museum site. The Imperial Bank of Canada, 1919 building on Richmond Avenue and uh, Claremont Road. The Grand Prairie Post Office nearby, a 1951 building. A Grand Prairie Co-op building, 1948. The GM Crummy Garage Company, the old Menzies Printers building, a 1930s red brick structure. The uh, Alberta Government Telephone Building on uh, I uh, forget the site, but it's a 1929 building, and also the Grand Prairie Courthouse. Of all those sites, there's one that is actually owned by the city. So the city's role here is twofold. First of all, it will have to agree to have this uh, structure designated a municipal historic resource. And then if they agree, then they're gonna to have to apply to the city to have uh, a bylaw developed and formally designated as a municipal historic resource. With this development, you can have it um, placed, apply to have it placed on the provincial register of historic places. And just like the, the provincially designated Forbes Homestead and the provincially designated Grand Prairie High School, it's eligible for matching grants for restoration work. So, uh, Charles, and I figured, well, you know, why don't we approach this one first of all? And if the city is agreeable and it is designated, hopefully the privately owned buildings, which is all the others, they will see the light and recognize that there's benefits to be made, but also responsibilities to be kept to maintain the building and to not demolish it or substantially alter it. So that is why we were here. Um, the, uh, if the city does uh, decide to designate it, you'll have to develop a bylaw, and there's a good template for what the bylaws look like. We could look with your work with your legal department to uh, come up with that. And then the uh, the city would have to city council would have to formally designate the building that it is applied to designate kind of weird, but kind of that's the way the system would work with this building. And then once uh, the building is designated, if it is, um, application will be made to have it put on the Provincial Register of Historic Places. And to submit that, you have to submit a copy of that designation bylaw, uh, a designation order, as it's called, and also a statement of historical significance, which we have developed and a statement of integrity, which will describe what the architectural features are and the actual condition of the building. And uh, once so designated, uh, the tenants at the time, which is the uh, Center for Creative Arts, they, I uh, believe, have been on site and are willing to this. Uh, I have to recognize, too, that this courthouse, the architectural features of it are all pretty well external. In other words, the building had been gutted to serve as a, a Christian school and then the Center for the Creative Arts. So there's very little within it. And so alterations within the building could take place. But the external building would have to be maintained as is. 
and uh, restored whenever the need is. And the integrity of the building must also be maintained. Now, this is a building that has good space to it, as you're familiar with, and that would prohibit, say, the building of a, uh, a McDonald's restaurant uh, 20 feet away or the prohibiting of a high-rise just 10, 20 feet away. In other words, the landmark the value of the building is very, very significant, which means it requires uh, space around it to be properly interpreted as such. So um, I've got on quite a bit. Maybe some of you have questions and all of that that I've been speaking about. Thank you, David. That was very in-depth, and I appreciate it. I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Taws, if you have anything to add before we go well, into questions? I would just like Thank you, Councillor Bosch. I would just like to add that uh, this process, as David pointed out, did start quite a number of years ago. And the, um, the study, the heritage inventory was created around 2006. Also at that time, there was um, a municipal historic resources plan developed, but it, was, it only ever reached a draft stage. And, and, and that was uh, part of that plan was to create a municipal heritage designation program, uh, similar to that that you find in, in other communities, including the county of Grand Prairie. And uh, that's what we're trying to continue here. Okay, thank you. I might add that the town assessment has also uh, been part of this municipal designation program. And they have a couple of sites there that are provincial historic resources, but they've added two that are now uh, municipally designated sites within the jurisdiction of the town. And the uh, County of Grand Prairie has uh, designated two of their sites. They have about eight in their overall administrative jurisdiction that are provincial historic resources, but they've designated two more, uh, the um, Good Fair Church and Manse and the um, a Hans Gauchy Homestead House at North Cluskin, and they're considering others at this very moment for municipal designation. All right, thank you. So I guess I'm going to ask uh, one question, if I may, so this may uh, help any future questions from our council. Um, do we know a cost or a near cost of what future renovations or restorations would be? Is any of that work been looked at? Well, we don't really know at the um, at the moment. Uh, Charles has looked at the building much closer than I had had an opportunity to, and at this moment in time, I don't see any uh, restoration work that is uh, needed at uh, at this time. So you can never tell uh, the uh, when something happens. If it's uh, some kind of minor disaster, you might some of you might recall that the Grand Prairie High School experienced a heavy snowfall about oh what. 12, 15 years ago, forget, and it was almost going to be uh, demolished because so much was uh, altered. But they made the decision that it's enough of it, it's salvageable, that it can be restored, and therefore so it was with uh, substantial help from provincial government coffers because it is a provincial historic resource and it was uh, stayed. So you, you really can't budget for that sort of thing because you never know when restoration work will be needed. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna open to questions and Councillor Thiessen has his hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Eric. I'll lower my hand so I don't get caught for other questions later in the in this. Um, so thanks, thanks for the presentation, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. I'm a, I'm a big advocate for for maintaining our historical building sites and uh, and replenishing them. And in fact, I sat on the Center for Creative Arts's board as vice president when we uh, undertook all those massive renovations that saw the dance floor put in upstairs and the whole gutting of the inside. Um, so I guess uh, my question, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one is in regards to preserving the building integrity as a historical site, um, much like the old Montrose school that was, that was uh, built into our Montrose Cultural Center, um, how that was restored due to roofing issues, would, um, would funding be able to uh, keep the, the building integrity intact, let's say, if the Center for Creative Arts needed to fix the roof? Is, is that something that 
the municipality could apply for to preserve the building? Yes, it absolutely could. Um, uh, the uh, I don't know what the condition is, but uh, the if something is falling in, falling apart, that is considered restoration because preservation work on it. But if you wanted to change it to something else and add something else, no, that would be out. Okay. No, that's great. And then uh, my other question is, uh, we do have other other uh, historical sites and buildings in the city of Grand Prairie that, that I noted didn't make the A-list. And more specifically, and if I got it wrong, uh, please correct me, but the, the old fire hall uh, that currently uh, is owned by the city of Grand Prairie and, and houses our CASD, as well as uh, the St. Joseph's Church which is now the community village uh, uh, in that area where we used to have the, the bell before they built the big church on Muscacipi. Uh, where do those fit in designations for historical building sites? Uh, I believe the fire hall is in the inventory that was, uh, that was uh, developed. So it's one that you certainly could consider. And uh, St. Joseph's Church, I'm not that familiar with it. But uh, certainly additional sites, and I respect additional sites, could be applied for. And then whatever, you know, maybe it's this committee that we have right now, would, uh, would consider that if application is made for preservation. So okay. any, any other site could be, uh, could be uh, considered as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is uh, okay, Mr. or er, Councillor Berg. Mr. Berg. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Bosch. Um, David, uh, good to see you again. I just want to make a couple of comments and then uh, ask a question. Uh, David and I, in the past, have worked on a number of projects. I was part of the Sexsmith Museum Society, and he is one of Alberta's foremost historians. So. Uh, when when a gentleman like this brings something forward like this, uh, it's something that we should all stand up and, and uh, uh, take his advice. Um, uh, David, one of the things that I had uh, when we were on the Sexsmith Museum Society, uh, it came up a fair bit that Grand Prairie was lagging behind in designating a number of buildings. As you mentioned, we only have two. In comparison, how many buildings designated does a, a small town like Sexsmith have? Okay, well, Sexsmith has uh, two buildings, the uh, blacksmith shop and the train station that are designated as uh, provincial historic resources. The grain elevator would have been, except there is this little legal problem that if the um, building is uh, owned or, uh, or affected somehow by the federal government, the province can't designate that as a provincial resource. Now, the Sexsmith uh, Museum Society owns the building, but their land it is on is CNR land, so there isn't that formal designation, even though uh, it's uh, pretty well committed that this building be, will be maintained. At the <clears throat> municipal level, uh, there are a couple of residences, the Innes House, which is where Carl Larson used to live, and the Anglican Church uh, have been designated as municipal resources, and also the old 1921 Sexsmith Grocery Store uh, has now been designated, and others being considered. So three uh, building sites in Sexsmith designated as municipal resources, and then the two, arguably three others, as provincial historic resources. Yeah, thank you. And if I recall, we did have the uh, lumber yard designated as well, but that was lost to fire. So thank you, uh, yes. Dr. Leonard, for the presentation. I appreciate it. Thanks. Gladys, or <laughs> Councillor Blackmore, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bosch. Um, my understanding of where the historical report, um, why it ended up kind of being shelved, was that the cost of maintaining buildings uh, in, with the integrity of the time they were built uh, was deemed by council to be more expensive than simply uh, maintaining them in uh, um, good condition. And 
So I'm wondering, uh, at that time, the uh, provincial designation led to quite serious restrictions of what could happen to a building. Uh, for example, the windows at the old uh, Grand Prairie High School, now the art gallery, had to be a particular type that were extremely expensive, but didn't really last very well because they were uh, windows that had been designed in uh, 1910, as opposed to the newer type of windows that we have available to us today. Um, my understanding is that because of those restrictions, that's why council chose not to go any further with uh, more designations of historical buildings. So I'm wondering perhaps, uh, Mr. Taz, if you could answer, um, if these restrictions for provincial uh, designations are as strict as they always have been, or if they've made some kind of accommodation for better building materials in uh, 2022. Uh, Councillor Blackmore, thank you for directing that question to me. I think David Leonard, though, would be better to answer that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there is that fine line between a renovation and restoration. And say earlier buildings in the city uh, tended to be multi-paned rather than large panes. And if it's impossible to get a multi-paned uh, building to fit the ethos of the original historic building, there is provision made that you can use larger panes of uh, the windows. I know that uh, many uh, wood frame buildings that have uh, shingles, whether well, it's uh, shingles or is it shakes, and if you can't get one, what is the closest that you can do? So there is a degree of uh, flexibility here. Uh, when you are restoring historic buildings. Uh, <clears throat> the buildings of Dunvegan, for example, if you've been up there, you will note that not all of the logs that are in those buildings are the original logs. You've had to have replacement logs, but the replacement logs were fairly easy to replicate because of the same kind of material, so you would intersperse those in with the original looms, and yet you can see the difference. Uh, that you have there. So if the materials are available, certainly that was what you would want and what the provincial government would require that you that you utilize in this uh, process of uh, restoration. So um, uh, hard to be more uh, detailed than that, but it's just to say that there is flexibility. And uh, the buildings, um, uh, like the Forbes homestead. Now, the, 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 I'm not all that as familiar as Charles with, but Charles, there have been new, ma new materials put into that historic structure that are similar to and replicate the original materials, I believe. Am I right? Yes, there, there's been some new materials during the renovation. Uh, quite recently, we had the exterior repainted and we were successful in getting over four thousand dollars in grants, uh, in grant from from the province because it's a designated resource. But uh, David, for the, the the courthouse, we're not planning to have it designated and brought back to its original appearance. We would like it designated to maintain the ethos of the building or the character of the city. And that would be the external building because most of the interior uh, has been renovated already to suit other purposes. So it's um, there are certain buildings that uh, are this way. In Edmonton, the McDonald Hotel, for example, completely altered, all, all, uh, altered inside, but the exterior evoking that same ethos of the 1914 period in which it was built. And this building that we're talking about, we could have interpreted as a center for creative arts, an art center, but there's no way that this art center, modern art center, is gonna be put on the provincial register of historic places. But a core house with all the activities that took place there, and it's the entire dispensation of justice uh, you know, all the way from uh, the Wapiti River to the Peace River, from east of Valley View to the BC border, all that took place in that building. And so even though the interior 
aside from a few little fixtures like railings and that, is uh, totally altered. But we interpreted that building as a courthouse, not as a center for creative arts. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I just have a, a clarity question back to uh, Councillor Thiessen's question. So for instance, if we did have to, you know, re uh, fix the roof or renovate the roof, that would be at the 50-50 matching grant, correct? Yes, uh, up, upwards to $50,000. But in recent times, that has been altered a bit because the provincial government sometimes goes through periods of austerity and periods of uh, expenditures. And sometimes there just hasn't been that much money in the pot to, uh, uh, to pay all of what is needed. And sometimes, therefore, the grants have been less. And I add, too, that the, it's more than just money. The uh, value of the work could involve, uh, for example, if you wanted to utilize, and you have access to, which I believe the city does, if you access to a Caterpillar tractor and operator to help with whatever is being restored, we'll put a value on that, and that will be part of the city's contribution to that 50%. So the part will be from the province, strictly monetary, and from the city would be some kind of expenditure, but also uh, contributions in kind. Okay, thank you. So I guess, would you have any idea what something like that would cost to repair a roof or re redo a roof? Um, because that would be one of our biggest um, considerations for restoration. Mm -hmm. Yes, since the roof is not something that people see, it could be very flexible on and how easy you do it. In other words, the, it doesn't have to look like at the very top, the uh, original roof, however it was. So um, I, I myself can't, uh, I, I am not familiar with construction costs and all that, so I couldn't put a monetary uh, uh, fixture on it only to say that at the very top of the roof, which might be tarred or whatever, uh, I, uh, it doesn't have to look like it did in 1957. But anything that the people can see from the public would have to be uh, maintained. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lenners? Thank you, Councillor Bosch. I have just um, two questions. Um, so, first of all, we we talked about maintaining the exterior of the of the building, and um, in recent years, they've um, I think it was Creative Center for Arts put up a pergola and and whatnot that kind of changed the the front. If we are to designate this, are are we supposed to designate it to what it looked like when it was a courthouse, or can some of that stuff all st stay up? Yeah, as much as possible. Of course, you can't adjust. Uh, alterations that have already been made. And I do believe that front piece above the door has been altered in just in different uh, recent times. So um, with that included with the building, uh, it shouldn't be altered anything further than that. No, this is this is more of a, this isn't part attached to the building. This is out in the, you know, 20 feet out in front. It's got a bunch of poles oh. and stuff sticking up out of the ground. And, you know, it looks like a, a garden, pergola that you would have in your in your in your yard oh, oh i see what you mean okay uh i'm not too familiar with that but that's 23 uh feet out front okay well that kind of alteration could take place or or whatever you put there as long as it isn't too intrusive like a like a you know a restaurant or whatever else you might want to consider putting in front there but uh i do believe what is in front there right now and i can't visualize it at this moment but certainly uh, uh be part of the uh the site and if wants to if you want to change that uh as time goes by that would be quite acceptable okay. and I, I guess my second question is it's this uh, preservation designation sounds a lot like getting married. So if you do have cold feet at the altar and you wanted to someday um, take your name off the list, is that is that possible? Uh, well, legally it might be, but you're in a lot of legal problems because if the provincial government has put money into the restoration and it's described throughout as a partnership 
uh, preservation program. If they've uh, put money into that, they have a legal uh, right to ask for that money back. So if you did uh, de-designate it, as it were, there would be a lot of complications. Of course, that sort of thing is not uh, at all encouraged. You preserve things to preserve them. And uh, there might be some sites uh, that uh, you would, uh, which the owners might uh, have cold feet because the uh, be a lot of alterations that would not be uh, uh, allowed. For example, the Grand Prairie College, Regional College, famous building, famous architect, uh, Douglas Cardinal and all. Now, that is a site that is very significant, and yet would the Grand Prairie Regional College, I guess it's a polytechnic now, would they be able to agree that we're not going to alter anything, they would get cold feet at that, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Liners. Uh, Director Miller, did you have a question? Thanks, uh, Chair Bosch. Just a couple comments uh, in regards to the roof. That's a capital project for uh, 2022, and the value is estimated at 115000 And uh, and then I just wanted to comment on our intent today with uh, having Dr. Leonard attend and uh, Mr. Towns as well, was to share information about uh, the potential of doing this. And then if there is interest from council and committee that uh, if you wanted to make a motion, then our plan would be to bring back uh, more details to uh, a more detailed report to committee. And then, uh, and then a decision could be made at that point. Thank you. Is there an, oh, okay, Councillor Burke. Uh, if there's no more questions, I would actually like to make that motion that uh, Director Miller um, had just alluded to, that uh, I make a motion that uh, um, administration bring forward uh, some more information and recommendations around designating the uh, courthouse as a provincial historical resource. Uh, that would be a municipal historic resource. Okay, thank you for the correction. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Burke. We have a motion in place, so can we call the vote? Just waiting a moment for our vote. Thank you, that uh, motion is carried. And thank you for the presentation. Um, you have a lot of knowledge in this, it's uh, impressive. So uh, we appreciate you coming out this morning. Thank you. Okay, next we are going to go to Director Miller for the Director Service Area Report. You're welcome to stay on if you'd like to watch, um, but we ask that you turn off your camera. Okay, thanks Chair Bosch. I'll start off with an update on the Community Knowledge Campus. So we're pleased to say that um, the foot traffic has, has increased by 17% for the first week of January in 2022 compared to the first week in December of uh, last year. And uh, East Link memberships, also we've seen a 7% increase in the month of December compared to November. Uh, and then just uh, wanted to share also our stocking stuffer campaign pre-Christmas was a great success. We had over five, or sorry, we sold 500 gift balls and we were sold out in two days. So we had some uh, exciting big value winners and, uh, and some really positive feedback about that as well. Switching to events and entertainment with the Nats Energy Centre, some details there. And I have a few more details than usual, just because we haven't had a meeting for a while. So um, the Best of Alberta Curling event was hosted from January 3rd to the 9th in partnership with the Grand Prairie Curling Club. The event hosted 16 teams, 118 athletes and coaches and support staff. The online viewership was high with over 200,000 live stream views and over 550,000 viewers through Sportsnet nationally. And then this past weekend, we had our first ever Grand 
Grand North Winter Festival, and it was celebrated with, uh, we had nice weather for it as well, January 14th to the 16th. A very warm response from the residents and the community and uh, in the region as well. So Benetz Energy Centre had over 2,000 ticketed guests take in the ice carving competition, the ice bar, the dark flavour snowboarding, pump track and live music as well. The Montrose Culture Centre uh, site had over 5,000 guests enjoy the Aquaterra ice slide programming by the Art Gallery and the Library, as well as uh, Green Path Energy Skating Oval and uh, live G DJs. Muscacipi Park had over 1,800 guests, plus uh, we also had one moose come out for the activities there. And uh, we had the, the Peace Draft Club Horse and Wagon Rides, skating on the pond with lighting features and also live DJs. Uh, just wanted to comment that the Grand North Winter Festival would not have been possible without the support of our community partners and sponsors, most notably the Grand Prairie Regional Tourism Association who invested both sponsorship dollars, event elements and staff that support as well. So a big thank you to all our city departments who came together to make this first year a resounding success and we're certainly already looking forward to uh, what we can do next year. Switching over to facilities, uh, January 12th we had a minor ammonia release at the Curling Club Ice Plant, uh, the safety systems worked like they should have. The building was evacuated. The system was checked over and recharged. And, uh, and just a thank you to the fire department as well for attending to assist with the incident. And then we're currently scheduling a vendor for our annual sensor testing and calibrations in all our arenas, chemical rooms, parking garage, garages, and uh, mechanical rooms as well. And our facilities team also arranged for uh, snow removal from the rooftops of specific buildings, including the museum, the curling club, the Coke Center on the east side on the second floor, and also uh, at uh, Montrose Cultural Center. With Fleet, we're pleased to say that uh, the two new 35 foot transit buses were put into service mid December, and we have a couple new replacement graders uh, due to arrive next month as well. The Sports Development, uh, Wellness and Culture, the Activity Center in the Smith Subdivision opened on January 10th. And uh, the Mobile Skate Park is set up in a portion of the facility, while the remaining activity space can be used for drop-in activities, registered programs, as well as we have uh, private rentals at the facility and, uh, and the meeting rooms are also available. And finally with transit, uh, just comment about the Northern Light Show. Initially we had 17 trips booked over a period of 17, or sorry, 10 days. But uh, due to the cold weather, some of the clients canceled their trips. At the end, uh, we ended up with nine trips with 68 people enjoying the Christmas lights. And that's my report to Chair Bosch, unless there's any questions. Thank you, Director Miller. Um, Councillor Berg has a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Miller. The one question I have is, do we have an update on the Eastlink Center uh, boiler and showers? Uh, thanks, Chair Bosch. Uh, I believe it, uh, just trying to recall the exact time period, but uh, it could be upwards of another month yet before. We, uh, we had to order the parts and the parts are being built in the, in the States and then shipped through Ontario and then uh, ultimately brought to Grand Prairie. But, but we did do some makeshift uh, hot uh, water tank installations on the pool deck as well as in the washrooms for, uh, for staff use and I believe for some for the public use as well. Yeah, thank you. Just a minor inconvenience. I was just curious. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Berg. Any other questions? Mayor Clayton. Thanks so much, Chair Bosch. Uh, Director Miller, you mentioned an increase in traffic at CKC, um, as well as an increase in membership at the East Link Centre. Um, are they correlated or is there an increase in traffic at the CKC uh, in one of the other facilities as well? Or is it primarily around the uptake in membership? Uh, I would have to dig into it a little bit deeper, uh, Mayor Clayton, but I, I believe it's due to the intake uh, or uptake in membership sales as well. And uh, we also did uh, recently, we, well, this is just fairly recent, but the, the $2 tuning track was brought back, trying to get more folks to uh, attend at the facility. But uh, I can ask uh, Angela Redding for further details if uh, committee would like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, possibly if you wouldn't mind just sending uh, council an email. I'm curious on the breakdown. Uh, we know that the pools due uh, to health measures are restricted in the number of people and people, the community are having to sign up for time slots at swimming. So I'm just curious where the increase is coming from. Certainly I can provide that in an email to council. Thank you, Director Miller. Mayor Clayton, uh, Councillor Thiessen has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair Bosch. Uh, this is sort of similar to uh, the mayor's question, uh, but uh, Director Miller, over the weekend, I received uh, nine unique emails or phone calls in regards to the East Link Centre and the restriction exemption program. And ag again, in the same similar vein, like uh, at what point do we get a discount from our property taxes for not being able to use these public facilities? Um, now, uh, one of the members I tried to talk to made an excellent point, I thought. Um, I said, well, you know, this provincial restrictions in our administration's hands are tied. But this gentleman said there's a fundamental difference between not using a public service or amenity and being told you cannot use it unless you do something first. Um, so uh, at what point is city administration going to review the REP and or um, consider potentially um, creating a discount for our residents who cannot use those facilities that they used to be able to enjoy. Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you for the comments. I think we uh, we did commit that in the initial stages that we would review it periodically. And uh, on a routine weekly basis, we monitor the information coming out from the province. If there's any changes through the REP or through the one third capacity, uh, approach. At this time, uh, I don't think we have any plans on changing, uh, but of course, if Council gave us direction to uh, to examine it further or gave us direction to, to change to a different approach, then uh, we would certainly listen to that advice. Uh, so I guess my other question is, um, is what are what are we beholden to with the province with these numbers changing uh, currently between fully vaccinated hospitalizations and ICU stats as well as unvaccinated hospitalizations and ICU stats? Uh, it's obvious that this is spreading whether you're vaccinated or not, and this is just turning into a discriminatory policy of coercion. So, at what point do we, as a municipality, or what powers and levers do we have to push back against the province outside of writing letters? Right. Uh, through the chair, uh, I think, uh, thanks for the question. Sorry, can I call a point of order, Mrs. Chair? Okay, I, based on? I think that this is a valid question that Council Teeson is asking, but I don't know if this is in Director Miller's service area, that perhaps this be a conversation if we want to have that's best to have as, as Council or with our City Manager, but I don't know if this line of question is within Director Miller's service area. I, I actually question the point of order, uh, Councillor Bressy, because all nine of the unique phone calls and emails that I received were in regards to Director Miller's service area in regards to recreation facilities. So I, I think it's an appropriate question to ask. May I add to this, because this may uh, allude to some of the questions by the public that you're getting. In the past, we had talked about um, one-third capacity versus REP and what conditions of use um, would change under the one-third capacity so the, uh, versus REP. So that information we had talked about as a council or as a committee, I can't remember which one, um, putting out to the public. Um, has that been done? So if we go into uh, the one-third process instead, there was other changes of use to the public. Has that been promoted in, in our communications um, so the public is aware that it isn't just, you know, one third or REP, there is conditions with both. Maybe Mr. Miller, if you can allude to um, that question. All right, uh, thanks for the question, uh, Chair Bosch. I think we have shared that information in the past about the, comparing the two different approaches to uh, how we do operate uh, business in our facilities. We have tried to uh, accommodate different user groups with different approaches. As an example, we've shared in the past, uh, if we didn't, did not have the REP in place at uh, Bennett's, 
Energy Centre, the Storm would not be allowed to uh, play their league games there. We uh, ERP down in uh, Muska CP Park, we do the one third approach so we can uh, allow users to uh, enjoy that site. The new activity center, we uh, we communicated a while back with the committee and council that it does fall under the REP just to, to maximize use of, at that site as well for the different groups. So we are trying our best to, uh, I guess, doing what we can and with the different approaches that are provided as guidelines by the province to uh, maximize use in our different facilities. We, uh, I guess, uh, going back to, uh, you know, we, we've had this discussion with our corporate leadership team as well, that we feel the best approach is to, uh, to listen to what the guidance is coming from the province. And then uh, we've shared information with council in that regard as well. So I think we're, we're doing our absolute best to try to accommodate the the numerous needs in the community. But, uh, Thank you, Mr. Miller. I do recall that there was conditions when you had to go to the one third. So if there's um, an easy fact sheet, I would love to see that. I haven't seen it myself and maybe other councillors have, but I'd love to see a, a, a quick and easy fact sheet on, for instance, the East Link Centre. If we have one third capacity, these are the restrictions. If we have REP, these are the restrictions. So. Um, People can easily find this information, and it and it's. I think that is one of the most difficult parts. Is the majority of the public, including myself, don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of some of these decisions made. So, um, if that hasn't been out there, I would love to see it. If it uh, if it is, I will I will look myself. So, thank you, Mr. Miller. Is there any other questions? Uh, Mayor Clayton and then uh, Councillor Blackmore. Just a, a comment uh, for Councillor Bosch. The um, health measures are very easily found on the provincial website. How they impact each facility is not really an easy process. If you're looking for some direction, I would suggest that somebody from committee make a motion. Uh, you know, to have a, a report to come back to say what the impact looks like on, on taking one form of action of the health measures compared to the other, um, you know, because it impacts each one individually. As mentioned by Director Miller, if um, if we do not abide by the restricted exemption program at the Bonnets Energy Centre, you know, the biggest piece there being that the Grand Prairie Storm would not be allowed to be part of the Hockey League. So each facility does have quite a unique situation. Um, if you're looking to see something like that, um, I would suggest it's more than just a quick email that potentially there be a motion. I really do like that idea, Mayor Clayton, only because this is what these calls are coming from, you know, our public that are, are using these facilities. So if it pertains to something that is near and dear to them, for instance, like the East Link Centre or uh, the Bonnet Centre, um, these quick facts, I, I'm hopeful that that isn't too intrusive of a job to do. But if we could uh, get someone to make that motion, I would appreciate it. Nobody wants to. Everybody um, knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'll I'll make that motion um, as as worded by Mayor Clayton. Thank you, Councillor Berg. Yeah, just so sorry to help legislative services clerk out. Um, my thought, uh, Councillor Berg, was that uh, the report being being brought back to this standing committee indicating uh, information um, with the facilities limitations based on one third capacity versus the restricted exemption program. I appreciate that, Mayor Clayton. Thank you. Thank you. I think that will be helpful for the public. Uh, Council, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Blackmore first and then Councillor Bressy. My comment does not pertain to the motion, and, and I'm not in your committee, so you should probably deal with the motion first. Okay. Did you want to speak to the motion, Councillor Bressy? Uh, that, that's okay. If you'd, if you'd rather me not, that's okay. Oh, no, you can. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 I was just, I was just going to say for... 
for me personally, what I'd find more useful is a quicker report than a more comprehensive hence report where I get a lot of questions about Bonnet's Energy Center and a lot of a lot of questions about Eastling Center. I don't really get questions about the museum. I get some about Dave Barr, but it might be worth committee limiting how many facilities are in there just because I'd rather get it quicker than every facility the city owns. Just a just a thought if, if you want my two cents. Yeah, so... Um I appreciate your comments. It's Councillor Berg's motion. Yeah. I, I get questions on many facilities. So I think a, a comprehensive list of the impact on all facilities would be important, but it's okay. Councillor yep. Berg's motion. So Yeah, and I'll, I'll leave it as maintained, but thank you, Councillor Bressy. I'll just add in my two cents. I just think a, a quick uh, fact sheet on each one, you know, just like, you know, a little box on this versus one versus the other, uh, a quick and easy read. Nobody wants to you know, have a three-page report on each facility. Um, but quick facts, I think, uh, would alleviate a lot of questions that people may have. So thank you, Councillor Berg, for uh, putting that motion. Uh, Councillor Boss? Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Thiessen. <laughs> I think that's hilarious if you're looking beside you as if I'm, I'm still sitting there. The computer's uh, there. I'm that's off. where I see you. Oh. There we go. I'm a talking head now. Um, yeah, I'm kind of in line with uh, what Councillor Bressy is saying. Um, I I don't know if, if even if we had a, this fact sheet, um, if if that's going to be accepted by the same people who are who are calling in and making complaints. The ones that I that I received complaints about uh, are e Eastlink Center, Coca Cola Center, Dave Barr, and Bonnets. So a smaller list for me, I think, is a bit more appropriate. I haven't heard anything about Center 2000 or the museums or, or any other buildings. It's just the ones that engage in recreational sports activities. And I think our, our new activity center is still too new to, for people to, to look at that as a place where they want to go and now they're not allowed to go uh, based off of whatever situation's going on in their life and their health. Um, so I, I don't know if I can support support this motion because I don't outside of the information I don't I don't know how appreciative our public's going to be of it thanks thank you Councillor Thiessen Mayor Clayton please go ahead um, to Councillor Thiessen's comments uh, I'm fine if the um, I would support um, if Councillor Berg um, wanted a friendly amendment to say recreation facilities I absolutely had four calls this weekend on the activity centers so um, I think that that's fair to leave it in the list um, so, Councillor. Yeah, I, I'll accept that friendly amendment. Be recreation facilities um, or um, activity, acti uh, recreation and activity facilities. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Can we call the question? Is there any other questions towards this motion? Then we'll go ahead and vote. Mine isn't showing, no, I'm in favor. And that is carried four to zero, thank you. Now, Councillor Blackmore, you had a question in regards to some of this information from Director Miller. Uh, yes, Director Miller, I just wanted to ask a question of clarification. Uh, Mayor Clayton mentioned uh, that the Eastlink Center is requiring bookings for lanes, et cetera, and I think that that's no longer the case with the REP program. Can you confirm or can you confirm that one way or the other? Thanks, uh, Chair Bosch. I believe at this time we are still uh, requiring some bookings, but uh, just because of our ratio of lifeguards to uh, users in the facility, but I can confirm that as well. But uh, last time I talked to Ms. Ranning, that that was the plan. We have uh, recently, we're trying to hire additional lifeguards so we can increase capacity as well with the ratio just to, so we, we should see an increase in that number of uh, bookings, but, uh, but I can confirm that as well. Okay, because I know my husband who swims every day is no longer booking lanes, he just goes. Okay. okay. So I have more current information than myself. Thanks. Okay. No worries. We can move on. Thank you, Councillor Blackmore. 
my e scribe's just reloading here. I'm having trouble with it today. Um, all right, so I guess we will go if uh, if you are complete, Mr. Miller, then we will go into uh, 3.2, <clears throat> the Recreation and Culture Cancellation and Refund Policy. And that is brought uh, to our attention by Shauna Hansen. So please go ahead, Shauna. Thank you, Chair Bosch. In February 2020, a new recreation management software was implemented at the city. It resulted in improved customer experience, collaboration among recreation departments, standardized processes, as well as enhanced program and client management. Prior to this, there was no formal council policy for recreation and culture cancellations and the related refunds. To provide a consistent approach across the city, administration is proposing a new council policy specific to this process. This policy outlines the timeframes within which customers can cancel a facility booking, programming registration or membership and receive a full or partial refund of fees paid. Administration is recommending that committee recommend council approve the recreation and culture cancellation and refund policy as presented. Thank you very much. And I open the floor for any questions. Thank you, Shona. Um, I do have a question in regards to this draft there. You have a section here where it says after the initial one month period, the customer may cancel the membership at any time with no penalty and will receive a refund based on the prorated number of days remaining in the membership period. Now, um, this is just um, a question in regards to buyer's remorse law. So we do have the buyer's remorse law in Alberta as well, where you have 10 days to um, discontinue uh, um, purchasing anything really. Um, has that been considered in this draft? Thank you, Chair Bosch. Um, so I can look into that legislation a little bit closer. Um, so our intent with the 30-day cancellation policy um, is just to ensure that we don't have members purchasing the annual membership with the intention of only using it for a very limited time. Um, what we've found historically is that customers may come in want to buy, say, a one-week membership um, because we only offer a one-month period. They will determine which is the lowest price method um, to have access to the facility, utilize that membership for a very short period of time, and then cancel. Um, so our intention is just to ensure that customers are buying the most appropriate membership type. Um, but as I mentioned, I can look further into that legislation and get back to council on that. Thank you. I'd appreciate that, Ms. Hansen. I, what I had read was uh, 10 days upon receipt of a written agreement, they have that opportunity to um, discontinue the agreement. So I just want us to make sure that all our avenues have been uh, researched before we put into a uh, put a policy in place. Is there any other questions from council or committee? Councillor Bressy. There it goes. I think my hands might have been too dry for my pad. Um, I'm just, I'm just, what, just a comment. Well, I guess question for administration. It's a very prescriptive. Uh, cancellations, refunds will not be given in a certain time frame. I'm wondering if there's any consideration put in for some sort of clause in there that gives staff the the right in extraordinary circumstances to waive that requirement. I'm just thinking in general, it seems like a really good policy, but every once in a while, there could be a really legitimate uh, personal-based reason for somebody to cancel. And I'd like to have give staff the discretion to very rarely provide provide a full refund but this seems like a very limiting policy Policy in terms of it saying no refund will be given, and that's the council direction. So is there any consideration, some sort of clause that would give staff a bit of, of discretion in those extraordinary circumstances? Thank you, Chair Bosch. Um, so 
In reviewing the policy, um, administration did take that into consideration. So the, the timeframes outlined in the policy is our standard process procedure. Um, there's always gonna be extraordinary events and we will allow supervisors, managers of departments to provide kind of shortened timeframes for those situations. Um, we wanted to lay out the basic framework for what our standard rules will be, um, but then still allow facility supervisors and managers to have that discretion. Great. So then just to please let me know. That yeah, no, that definitely that definitely answers the answers the question. I'm glad to hear that. Just to just to comment to committee, I wonder if so, if an amendment to make that explicit in the policy though is required. Because in my mind, there shouldn't be a discretionary. We can step outside of, call, of council policy, and so I think that if it's council's intent to allow staff to waive this policy in extraordinary circumstances, that should probably actually appear in the council in the council policy. Thank you, Councillor Bressy. Would someone in this committee like to uh, put that motion in place? I have a question additionally. So for the request that I had for this buyer's remorse piece, is that, sh should that go into a motion as well? Or does that just go back to to work on it? So if I can, a couple things you could, uh, committee could just defeat uh, that this motion be sent to council for consideration and just ask that it come back to the next appropriate standing committee with uh, the two items as discussed. So if it's defeated um, and just then there could be a subsequent motion bringing back, um, you know, the, a report to the next standing committee with the two items as indicated. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So, okay, Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, uh, similar to Councillor Clayton's, I don't know if we need to actually put this to a vote and defeat it. Um, we could just table it for those those very same information pieces to come back and and to report to the to our next community services committee meeting. So um, I, I'll make the motion that we table this uh, until those two questions by Councillor Bosch and Bressy are answered until the next uh, community services committee meeting. Perfect, thank you, Councillor Thiessen. We will uh, move to get more information on this, thank you. I guess not move, we will <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> wording. Thank you for your help, guys. Thank you. The motion was to table the item. So we'll put in that into question and vote. And that is carried four to zero. Thank you. Next, we will go into 3.3 .3, event center business case. Uh, Catherine Ridgeway is here to speak to this. Hello, Catherine, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Chair Bosch. Can you get to me all right? Please? We can. Thank you. Okay. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair Bosch. Um, today we are discussing the motion to explore the feasibility of a change order to the recreation and culture strategy to add the event center business case to the plan. Administration is recommending committee recommend council approve the event center business case proposal submitted by RC Strategies with a financial investment $56,950. Um, procurement has advised that adding the event center business case scope of work to the recreation and culture strategy project is a reasonable change order. RC Strategies is the consulting firm that has been procured to develop the recreation and culture strategy for the city. And they have confirmed they have the capacity and expertise to take on the event center business case. Um, so to note, there have been two previous business or master plans completed 
um, exploring the future of live events uh, venues in Grand Prairie. Both studies highlighted Grand Prairie strength as a regional hub and a large, with a large geographical reach, young demographic, and above average household income as attractive attributes for greater opportunity for expansion in the live event industry. Um, it's important to note that both of those studies only focused on renovations to the downtown um, current location. Um, the addition of the event center business case to the recreation culture strategy will produce economies of scale between the two projects. The majority of that savings will come um, during the research and data collection phase, having the opportunity to collect data for both projects simultaneously in surveys and interviews could yield significant saving. So the business case will provide council with information on a market overview, which will include a full market profile, industry trends assessment, utilization anal analysis, and a competitive competition review and assessment. It will also compile a needs assessment, which will include data collected through surveys and interviews, a program confirmation workshop with the project steering committee. So that will include city staff, major stakeholders, and members of council. This workshop will establish the desired programs for the new venue and be a guide to outline what amenities we'd like to include in, in the new venue to have those desired programs. Um, most importantly, the study will explore the risks and benefits to the city of Grand Prairie, including state case studies from other municipalities. Um, case studies will provide information from similar facilities and similar geographical locations and populations. Um, exploring building amenities, auxiliary uses, capital funding methods, governance, and revenue distribution to the greater region. And finally, the report will examine venue needs and specifications for both a renovation to Bonnet's Energy Center or a new standalone facility, as well as the repurposing of the Bonnet's Energy Center to a performing arts center. The venue needs and specifications will also include design considerations with capital and operational costs associated with each option. Um, so the proposal from RC Strategies sets a project budget at 56,950, which includes the full business case um, with basic architectural support and a high level diagram and associated capital costs. If council requires detailed 3D modeling, um, renderings or animated walkthroughs of the spaces, um, that will be an additional cost uh, between 10 and 15,000, depending on the level of rendering we'd like to see. Um, so the city of Grand Prairie, as we know, is a metropolitan hub of Northern Alberta with the market strength and demographic to be able to pull a larger portion of the entertainment industry to the area. Grand Prairie residents can continue to spend their entertainment dollars outside of our city. The age and capacity of our current downtown event venue requires council to start planning for the future of live events and sport in the city. Engaging RC strategies to prepare the event center business case is a prudent first step the development of a long-term plan for the live events in the city of Grand Prairie. RC Strategies is well positioned with a strong staff complement that possesses the expertise and experience in Alberta to develop a well-rounded business case. Um, thank you and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ridgway, um, for your presentation. Do we have any, okay, Councillor Burke, we have a question. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Rosemary. One of the things that I had noticed in there is I, I feel that this is targeting a, a more specific outcome. Um, is there any research, or could you, could you educate me a little bit, on an independent performance arts center outside of renovating the current Bonnets? Is that part of the study? Through the chair, it is not. So that piece came out of discussion with the previous council that they wanted to look at alternative uses for the Bonnet Energy Center and then that performing arts piece came up. So it's not a standalone item, but we could look to add it if required. Yeah, uh, the one thing that I'm, I, I keep continue to hesitate on uh, even well before I was uh, elected to city council is the current building from what I understand still has 25 years left on it. Um, so that's, that's just one of my hesitations. So I, I, I campaigned a lot on, on the recreation and cultural master plans. I'm really excited that this is uh, potentially a, a more updated, more accurate um, report. So uh, again, I will speak in favor of this, but I do hesitate 
that it uh, might be too specific, but I think once we get involved in it, we can um, potentially steer that a little bit. Um, so so I, I will speak in favor of, of the report, but I think what I'm reading here is just a little too, too specific and too aimed at a specific outcome. Thank you, Councillor Berg. I do have a question, uh, Ms. Widgeway. So uh, last council had approved up to $200,000 in capital fund, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> in capital funding uh, to the 2022 budget. So if this is roughly 56,000, um, the remaining approximately 140,000, whether it's through you or through administration, where do those dollars go? Through the chair, yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say that's a little bit above me, I'll leave that for one. But, uh, thanks, Chair Bosch. Uh, I believe the, the original funding sources for the 200,000, 125,000 was from the future expenditures reserve, and the other 75,000, if approved, would have come from council strategic initiatives funds. So if we do this, uh, if you make a motion today to approve it, it's 56,000. That could come from the FER, and then the remainder just stays in the FER, and then we don't tap into uh, council's uh, fund as well. Perfect, thank you. Is there any other questions from the committee? Not seeing any. Would someone like to make a motion? Sorry, Chair Boss. Oh, you have a question? I, uh, oh, sorry. I do, I do. Um, Catherine, uh, or Ms. Ridgway, sorry. Uh, just a question in regards to the, the work that this the organization is going to do on our behalf if this passes from RC strategy. Um, are they going to identify potential other land areas and then best place locations if they deem the downtown uh, renovation of the Bonnet Energy Center to um, not be appropriate, that there may be more appropriate places to build an event center in the city? Will they identify those lands? Thank you through the chair. No, Chris, that is not part of the scope of work. We could maybe ask for, I think they're gonna talk about the footprint required if we do wanna do an entertainment district, but an actual location, that was not part of the scope. Okay, so this is all just for the downtown. Uh, they will look at what it would require to build a new facility. They may say X number of acres, but where those acres will be placed in the city won't be specified. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thiessen. Is there uh, an option to, if we have up to $200,000, is there an option to increase that scope to other than just the Bonnet Centre? Thank you, Chair. I, I believe so. The scope can be as large as Council would like it to be. Is that something that committee would like to see? ourselves going outside of just the one footprint. My concern is if we we do this for $56,000 and then we say, oh, just a minute, we're going to do another one. Um, could some of the costs of already doing this um, be, you know, uh, reasonable steps to bring down future costs in increasing the uh, proposal or um, strategy? Councillor Burke? I guess the way I'm viewing this is this is, I guess, the second step of, of a few steps walking along. So rather than spending money on steps three and four when we don't, we're not even sure we're going to go down steps three and four, I think this might be um, the best financial way to go is just to take step two and then reevaluate the direction we want to go from there and not head too far down a path that we may not want to explore. Okay, thank you, Councillor Burke. Anybody else? Mayor Clayton? Thanks, uh, Chair Bosch. So um, at a high level, I have some concern about this intent. Um, you know, this would be the th third proposal that we see of the future of a facility that no council to date has supported. Um, and so um, significant money goes into proposals every single time. Um, I um, personally, though, I guess a question for Dr. Miller, Tell me when the 
tourism and cultural strategy is expected to come back to council um, for review. Uh, through the chair, uh, I believe our plan is uh, late summer, perhaps uh, into September to have the, the completed uh, rec culture plan back with the uh, councils for councils area. So then a, a question for Ms. Ridgeway, um, with that work being done and this being added on to that, is the price the same if this work is paused until we see that work come back? Um, through the chair, I think there would be an additional cost, Mayor Clayton, just because um, they're looking to compile the data collection piece. So when they go for a survey, they'll survey both the strategic plan and the business case at the same time. So there would be additional cost if we went out later in the process, but I can go back to RC Strategies and see what that number is. So, I mean, to committee, this motion, the motion as in front of you, um, not stated yet, but as recommended, would be to have this discussion um, at a council level. So, um, given that, I'm happy to make the motion that committee recommends council approve the event center business case proposal um, with the financial investment of 59 or 56,950. And that being said, um, I look forward to a a full discussion at council. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. We'll put that to a vote. Thank you, that is carried. Thank you, Ms. Ridgeway, for your presentation, and uh, we look forward to discussing this further as a council. Next, we will go into 3.4, Twin Ice Arenas operating, and we have, sorry, I'm jumping through different things here. Stephanie, uh, can you say your last name for me, Stephanie? Of course, it's Casually. Casually. Perfect. Thank you, Mrs. Casually. If you uh, want to start, please go ahead. Thank you, Super Chair. When Council adopted the Grand Prairie Regional Recreation Committee ice allocations framework, uh, administration was directed to investigate cost disparities identified in the report between the operation of the Twin Ice Arenas in the city and the County of Grand Prairie. Administration collaborated with County Administration and discovered that the County of Grand Prairie, uh, for the purposes of the report, isolated the costs associated with ice usage, uh, whereas the city utilized complete facility uh, expenses. So review of the operational costs from 2019 uh, showed that city operations cost uh, $237,000 more than county operations for the same period. Um, part of this uh, variance is that the Coca-Cola uh, Center Financials included not only um, operation of the two arenas, but at that time also the operation of the synthetic turf fields, the grandstands, uh, the concession, which was city operated, as well as uh, maintenance for the outdoor skating oval. The variance in operating uh, expenses is due primarily to utility costs, which is certainly not surprising given the number of amenities um, included in that budget. Salary expenses also correlate to the number of amenities offered and the staff required to provide services for those amenities. Additionally, the Coca-Cola Center opened in 2003, whereas the Crosslink County Sportsplex opened in 2013, and typically aging infrastructure certainly has some higher operating costs than newer facilities. Um, administration recommends that council receive this report for information. Thank you, Ms. Casually. Is there any questions to this presentation? Seeing none, oh, sorry, Councillor Lehner. Um, thank you, Councillor Bosch. Um, one question on the on the <clears throat> on the, the twin rinks there. Does the concession stand alone? Does it pay for itself, or does it, uh, or is it a loss leader in that operation? Uh, thank you, through the chair. 
So the operation of the concession um, at the Coca-Cola Center has uh, just went into RFP uh, last year. So it is a fairly new um, setup for the organization. Previously, the, the concession was owned and operated by the city of Grand Prairie. And now there is a contract in place and it is uh, operated by a service provider. So um, I don't have information on the details of that uh, to date, but if, if there's interest in that, that is certainly something we can bring back to uh, council. Yeah, it just seems like that's um, that seems to be the different difference. You've got staff that run that operation, and and so that would separate us perhaps from the other place. But I, I thought they had a concession over at the other it, uh, in, in the county as well too. But um, yeah, it does does still seem like it's you know significant. And um, did you did you notice anything that uh, from the examination that we can improve or areas that you know maybe they're doing differently or better or you know, things that we could share that to enhance um, the efficiencies of, of our uh, facility. Thank you, through the chair. Um, certainly one of the um, potential challenges related to um, utilities is that previously the um, utilities for the Coca-Cola Center uh, were serviced by a single meter for uh, numerous facilities across the campus. So the organization is underway to install individual meters, uh, which will enable the city to identify the actual utility uh, costs per building across the campus. So it is expected um, that we will see um, some savings there. One of the differences also in relation to uh, utility use of, between the two buildings is that the Coca-Cola Center also has some different um, needs for uh, for the facility because there are uh, numerous meeting spaces as well as uh, lease and uh, city staff offices in the Coca-Cola Center. Um, the heating and cooling requirements are a little bit uh, different than um, sort of just arena space or um, field house space. And I, I do note that the Cross Lake County Sports Plex certainly um, does have some loose space uh, in their facility, but uh, the city does experience a little bit um, different. And uh, since this, the, this analysis was conducted on cost of 2019, because um, they were thought to be comparable at the time, since then, um, the city has also um, isolated the budget for uh, the synthetic turf field and the grandstands from the Coca-Cola Center operations. So, um, definitely there would be improved reporting if we were comparing um, facilities uh, at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thiessen, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair Bosch. Uh, on uh, Councillor Lehner's second round of questions, he actually asked my question. So if there are no further questions, um, I'd just like to move that uh, committee recommend Councillor receive this report for information. Or we received this report for information. I mean, that's uh, my question isn't to the motion. It's for administration. The motion's still in order. But uh, uh, Ms. Casualty, can you tell me, um, as you mentioned, there was many variables that uh, you're expecting will get um, cleaned up, per se, uh, with, um, you know, addition of an individual meter at the facility with the potential of taking the um, field house out of the crosslink in calculation. Um, does council expect to see an update once these uh, changes are made in regards to see how much closer um, when we're actually comparing apples to apples the cost of operation is between the two facilities? Go ahead, Ms. Ridgway. Or, I'm sorry, Ms. Casually. Uh, thank you through the chair. Certainly, uh, there is a direction from council uh, for administration to report back. We're happy to do that. Sure. I mean, I hate to leave something on an outstanding items list for a year. So um, <laughs> I'll make a note and um, bring it back later in the year. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So a motion is in order. Unless there's any other uh, comments towards the motion. Please go ahead. And 
that is carried. Thank you. We had a fair amount of business today. So next we go to correspondence. Is there any correspondence that we need to look at? No? Other business? No? <laughs> okay. Bylaw and policy review. No? Okay, this is the easy part. Outstanding items list. All right, uh, thanks Chair Bosch. Uh, just a couple updates for uh, committee today. So in regards to 1172, the sport hosting grant, that was actually addressed at the December 13th council meeting uh, where Katie Bieberdorf uh, provided an update. So that one can be removed with committee's permission. And then uh, with Item 1161, the on-demand transit service standards. Uh, I found out yesterday that we're still waiting from data, or sorry, for some data from the, the contractor who's helping us with that project. So if we could move that uh, to uh, February 15th, please, would be uh, helpful for us. And then uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Clayton, for your comments. Uh, 1156, we're happy to remove that. And then we'll also keep it in mind to bring uh, updated information back a year down the road. So. Thank you, Director Miller. So I'm looking for uh, a motion to for this outstanding items list to be. Oh, you have a question, or are you looking for a motion? Happy to make that motion. Oh, thank you. Happy to make the motion, as you just mentioned, that to receive the outstanding items list as amended. Perfect. And that is carried. Thank you. So we are ready to adjourn. That was a long one. Thank you all for uh, being a part of it. Great job sharing, Chair Bosch. Thanks for filling in for me. I'll just check with the Legislative Services, services Clerk. I know we have a in-camera schedule for 1030. Or what a, right. OK. Okay, so let's just take a quick five minute break before we move on to um, infrastructure and economic development um, as we have um, a lot of business today. Thanks.